recording started. So, big concept here is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive, inclusive economy of abundance. That's our vision. With that, if you can scale the process of design to many people doing very, very small parts, that's power. How do you do that? Modular breakdown. And we have certain techniques and the ability to use FreeCAD and upload and download to the wiki where you can produce uh, amazing results. And we'll have a great experiment in that. Can we, all together, instead of one, one master CAD designer, can we actually contribute little parts and components to the universal axis? We'll try exactly that. In a nutshell, the idea is um, anything is made up of primitive elements. You've got cubes, spheres, cylinders of all shapes. And if you manipulate them and combine them all together, you get any kind of a shape. Now, there's also curves of different kinds of curves, but with the basic forms um, and what's known as Boolean <laughs> operations. So Boolean operations is the idea that you're combining, adding or subtracting, intersecting, cutting. Uh, so there's an ability within FreeCAD to execute a workflow where each person is designing an individual part. So for example, you have the universal axis, you've got the structure. Well, there's holes in there. There's a belt hole. There's motor holes. There's a motor. Well, what would it look like if each person took one of those and worried only about one of those? And then we throw that all in a pot, stone soup, and make it into a final design. So we're going to explore exactly how that technique can be enacted with a large team here after we learn a few basics about FreeCAD. So that's pretty exciting. We've never done that. It's, uh, so specifically, we'll use FreeCAD and the ability to do Boolean operations. So one person designs one thing. Like, for example, if it's a bolt hole pattern for the stepper motor that we have, you will draw simply four cylinders of X length they will have to match the bolt pattern of the motor so that's the science in there it's like okay everything has to match so there's real numbers involved you have a dimension um, now so take the actual structure of the universal axis say motor piece and you take those holes well how can so in the simplest example how can two people work on that together well, you don't have to wait for one person to get finished with the, the body of the motor piece and the universal axis for the next person to put the holes on there. You can just start drawing them. And then you say, okay, then we're going to merge, um, basically take the two files, merge them into one document, and simply subtract. So, you get, so one person is drawing a solid object, which corresponds to the hole pattern, and then you go body minus holes. And then you're going to get a body with the, without the holes. Can we use that? So, so think about that. How do you break apart the complex geometry of the universal axis, which does have some complexity, like, for example, the belt peg hole. It's a profiled shape that accepts the, uh, the belt, so it actually follows the contour of the belt. And it's, you know, it's sloped a little bit to accept the belt peg. Well, the, the part that's key to this modular breakdown is the breakdown itself. How exactly do you break down an object to understand its underlying parts so that you can distribute that to a large team? So this can, in principle, scale in, a, in an amazing way. So I look forward to this experiment today, and then we can um, do that with many more people. So say you wanted to do not just the motor piece, but then so you got maybe like 10, piece, 10 parts um, on a motor piece, you got another 10 parts on the carriage piece, and 10 on an idler. Well, that's 30 people right there just doing the CAD. They could be completely busy. There may be another person doing the integration, like as soon as somebody has a part, uh, they would manage the team and maybe like uh, import that so there's another person uh, so, so you can come up with a whole team ecology of how you solve a massive problem quickly by parallel breakdown. Very powerful concept. We'll do that for the first time here. I don't know of anybody who's done this yet on this planet. I mean, I don't know if anyone's experimented with that. Um, I haven't heard about it because typically the, the way things work in standard CAD when you have 
a workflow management or PLM, product lifecycle management or software that is used to design products, you check something out, everybody's locked out. <coughs> then you put that back into the pot and other people can work on it. Here we're all working on individual parts. Now, are we still locking people out because one person's working on a part? Not necessarily because we can have two people work on the bolt holes and maybe they can work next to each other and as soon as they have anything, they upload it because people will work at different rates. The first person just uploads it straight to the wiki using the versioning system of the wiki. Matthew? This happens, uh, drawing from experience with software, one of the things that's important is to make sure that you are working on the same plan so that everything uh, meshes. Yeah. So like everything fits where it's supposed to and you don't end up with one piece that's a different size than the other piece of the other person. Exactly. So, so Matthew is mentioning how the coordinate system is very important and scale is important, so you have to know all that. That's part of interface design. But the way we can do that is you select the origin and make everything symmetric about the origin so that when you're making, the, say, the, the rectangular piece for the body, the motor piece, uh, 3D printed piece, then that's exactly <laughs> around the origin. So then the person knows, okay, I know the origin is there, and compared to the origin, say, the bolt pattern is there. And it's not just about the uh, the symmetry or whatever, but it's just making sure that all of origin the, that for instance that, that like for instance that this piece uses the same connector as this piece or whatever. Yeah. And everybody's communicating on how they're going to match up. Yep. And you're building upon part libraries where some of that language is already pre-designed, so you can say, okay, well we accept that right now. If you have an iteration, sure, change it by all means. If you've got a better idea you can change it and just save it as a different version and note it, okay, this has this particular change and that can live there as long as we know what part is what, we can all do that. And if it's a better design altogether, then we can say, okay, this is the main version we're going with, we'll keep using that from now on. But conflicts are pretty much resolved because it boils down to who uses what. If, a, if you, you think you're a hot shot and you upload something and you say this is the best thing in the world and nobody uses it, well, maybe it's not the best thing in the world. So it's kind of a self-governing mechanism where the number of downloads and, and how a part is remixed and reused really determines who's the king of the, the game here, where, where we all want to be kings and contribute a little bit to the thing. But any of these conflicts about attribution then, I think some are somewhat resolved. Um, simply the meritocracy this is governance by meritocracy the best best designs win and then we continue building upon them so that's a that's a good topic uh, so we'll explore that live today just in, in a little bit uh, so first I'll I'd like to go into the lesson for today which is the design guide I believe it's lesson number seven so let's go to design guide OSC machine design guide uh, toolpath generation lesson number seven so I'll do a quick survey of every of um, the concepts and then the tools that we have available today, particularly in the open source, of course, that can allow us to do all of that. <coughs> so let's start with uh, what is toolpath generation? You've got a machine that has some kind of a tool head on it. You've got a frame, universal axis, let's say, and a tool head of some sort, whether it's a cutter or a, an additive manufacturing thing, like a 3D printer laser cutter or whatever, how do you move that tool around? How do you generate, like if you want to cut out a pattern for say your bolt mounting on a tractor, whatever, wheel mounting, um, how do you go from that idea to an actual build? Is that a question? Oh, no, no question. Yeah, uh, how do you do that? So the conceptual, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. So the conceptual idea there is um, you've got physical motion, and how do you tell the computer, your, your Arduino brain, with its Marlin firmware or software on top of that, how do you tell it to do what you do? And that is, it is G-code. It's G-code is the most widely used numerical control programming language. So G-code is basically the commands. They look like G1, X20, like numbers. It's, it's a little simple, simple language that allows you to say, okay, move here, go there, do a circle um, with, with that tool head. So it, it covers motion as well as turning other things on and so forth. So 
for whatever tool you have, you're going to have corresponding G codes and various properties of that G code that, that are relevant. Like if you're doing 3D printing, you're pretty much filling in a pattern and say it's a solid object that you're trying to 3D print. So basically you're like zigzagging back and forth to deposit all the, all the material. That's your tool path. <clears throat> for a cutter, like, a, like say a CNC torch table, you want to cut out a plate with a bolt pattern. You tell it, okay, go to the contour. Just go around it, then turn off the cutting gas, go to a <laughs> hole, turn the gas on again and cut out that hole. Uh, then maybe stop the gas and stop the flame and then move to, over to another hole and so forth. So basically, um, various commands that are relevant to a particular tool head. You have to consider various properties of that tool head. Like for example, if there's the, the width of the tool head and the software takes care of all of that uh, for you. So let's talk about some of the uh, the ways to do that. So typically you want to use, you can do this manually or with software. So manually you can say, okay, G1, like go to X00, zero, zero, then go to this place. For simple shapes, like say a wheel plate on a tractor, for mounting that, you can just program that by hand. But if it's a complex thing like a 3D printer job, I mean that's many, many lines. You Like each layer might have like a thousand lines. So good luck doing that by hand you want to use software but you can do it if you want to be die hard you can just say oh yeah I'm just gonna go there and you just gotta like trace it out if you have nothing better to do so let's talk about some concepts uh, relevant open, open source there's plenty of it we'll get into that there's tons of it so so um, general concepts here so curf for example uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking on that curf is the width of the tool so you've got a cutting tool and when you when you cut with it, you're gonna get a particular curve is right there uh, in the picture, the width of a cut. Um, offset. So offset can be like when you're, for example, on a 3D printer, we've got the bed in a certain location, we've got the homing of the axes where when they go to the end stops. That may be one location, but but you tell the computer an offset, which is okay. Well, the bed is not all, not like where you started with your axe with your zeroing, but the bed is off a little bit. So say okay, go ten over and uh, and ten over more to reach the bed. So offset is a concept. Run out. Run out is the when a tool is spinning, it's not perfect. It might wobble a little bit. Run out. Uh, picture of run out. Okay is when when a tool is not going perfectly in a circle but it might wobble a little bit so you have to pay attention to that backlash backlash is the idea where when two things mesh like a belt on a pulley they're not there there can be a little tiny gap or like when gears mesh there's gonna be a tiny little gap because you can never get it perfect and if it is perfect it might change over time so when you turn something one way it will take a little bit for it to engage again in the other direction and you have to account for that when you're doing your machining. And that software, for example, on our CNC circuit mill, we measured what that is, and we corrected that automatically in the tool path generator. Shavings or swarf. Look at that picture. So what are shavings or swarf? It's, it's all the stuff that comes off when you're m milling something. It could be dross from a, a cutting of steel with a CNC cutter. Rest. Rest is a, another support. Say you're on a lathe, it's rest. Literally, like it says, you rest the workpiece on that so it can spin between two centers. This is the rest for a wood lathe in this case. Um, rough and finish cuts. When you, when you do milling, you might want to do a rough, rough pass first and then smooth it out with a finer bit. So that's, that's what it would look like. Um, so high speed versus high torque machining. So if you do high speed, if you machine at very very high speed you're gonna need less torque or you can go at very low speed with very high torque like for example we built the heavy-duty uh, drill press and on that we had a very slow moving bit like um, like maybe 50 rpm 100 rpm but we can take because it was hydraulically powered this was in a maybe like 2009 or something um, I could cut one inch holes straight with that through metal. It was, and, the, and, the sh 
and the shavings were huge, <laughs> but it was super high power. I actually put a hydraulic motor on that device. But if you have an electric motor, you have much less torque. You typically want to go faster and take very tiny cuts. Uh, trochoidal milling. It's the idea that you, uh, and there's efficiencies involved with this, but basically you have a tool that goes not straight through a cut, but it goes and then kind of takes a bite, a semi-circle, moves forward a little bit, and that allows the milling to happen with much less force and much more control and less wear on the tool. Oh, so a big, like, little circle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, which allows you to, like, with a lower power mill or something, to do more with that. <laughs> it's because it's just taking le s s l uh, smaller cuts. It's moving really fast, but it's just taking small cuts while getting you that large slit because it's moving in that pattern. Uh, ramping. <laughs> Take a look at William. Come back. Uh, ramping video. Uh, ramping is when you go successively down into a workpiece. Instead of just say you want to mill something, uh, you're starting, you know, you got the, some solid object, you want to mill it. You don't go like straight into it with all the tool. You might want to start up and take it a little bit, you know, start wearing down at it before you get to the bottom. But let's take a look at a video for ramping, William. Oh. Yeah, you can do that. So that's ramping where you're just gradually going into a workpiece and so diving right into it. Uh, onion skinning. So when you're cutting things out, say out of wood, the uh, next onion skinning link, when you're cutting out of wood, you don't want the pieces necessarily to fall out because they might, might then like get in the way of the mill bit. So what you do is you cut almost all the way through, and that's that's what it's showing. There's a light. It doesn't really. Uh, the picture. He doesn't show any of that. Um, but basically, you leave a little onion skin, very thin slice at the bottom, so that the piece of material stays there. But you can punch it out very easily afterwards, so that you don't inter you don't get that jumbled up and getting loose and fly out when the tool hits it again or something. Holding tabs, that's the same concept where you go through all the way but leave little little tabs that still hold the workpiece. Oh, I don't have a picture of that. Think about going through a cutout of a circle, you j maybe just leave a little tab that's just not done on one side and the other so that that little cutout remains there until the finish of the job and then you can knock it out easily. <clears throat> Two-sided milling and registration, so if you're milling something, say you're milling some flat object, you want to turn it to the other side. Well, you have to know where you're milling on the other side. So you have to have some means of registering where you are. And there's different ways to do that. Nesting and material efficiency. There's an open source software called SVG Nest. Uh, let's take a look at the demo. Click on that. So nesting means that when you cut out something out of a flat sheet, let's say with, with routing or CNC uh, plasma cutter or laser cutter, you you have to arrange the, the pieces that you have on, on a sheet of on a sheet of metal and the way that works yeah so right there you've seen that all those pieces like to, to, to do this by hand would take you some time you have to move each piece and so forth there's software that does it automatically it's a very technically difficult problem mathematically but you can get pretty good results yeah Whoa. yeah yeah. You have so, to save material, right? Yeah. yeah, you want to save as much material. Artificial intelligence on that can help because you might not, you know, you have to, you kind of have to do trial and error. If you have like a 50 or 100 or 1,000 pieces you want to cut out, I mean, the human brain's not really capable of doing that efficiently for, for very complex shapes that you might not notice how, what the best pattern is. So nesting is a, an important thing. I mentioned about the frame nesting for the CNC, the, uh, no, for the, the 3D printer, where we nest the frames one inside the other for material efficiency. We cut out first a 16 inch frame out of a four by eight foot sheet. So that's 48 by 96 inches. So we take one 16 inch frame, another one and another one um, at each four foot width. But then we take out the smaller pieces right from inside. So we get 16 inch frames, 14 inch, 
12 inch 10 inch frames that's another way to nest where you have a hundred percent material efficiency if you use all the inner cutouts does it let you use the DXF file to do that? Yeah, yeah, that program is, is uh, flexible. Uh, and there's other ones, and I'll, I'll go through all those. So what is, what kind of machining number, number of dimensions can you work in? 2, 2.5, 3, and 4 plus axes are common. So what's 2.5? What's 2? 2 is when you're doing two-dimensional cuts like CNC torch table, you're only on a plane. 2.5 is when you're in three dimensions, but you're only but you don't have all so this is an example so that's plane on a plane this is 2.5d where you only have you have the full xy but on the z you can only go up and down with a tool head so you cannot have any overhangs so with a 3d printer <laughs> you can definitely do 3d printed overhangs but for machining you can't do that if you have like a, just a three axis mill it's moving like this like that and then up and down you cannot do overhangs so you'd have to have another axis there uh, unless you're doing 3d printing uh, so three-dimensional milling is common I mean but after seeing that I don't know um, take a look at multi, like more than three axis machine what's more than three axes like four or five uh, or six, you add, start adding rotational axes. So X, Y, Z is linear motion, but then you can start, okay, can you click on that? Go down, down. Four plus axes. So, and scroll down a bit to the, the axis so you can move in three dimensions. And then you can add another axis, like say you put, you put a rotating axis on the X. So say you put a lathe element onto your, you've got three axis motion and you put a lathe chuck there that can rotate, well that's your fourth axis and that allows you to do much more stuff or you can put one on the X, another one on the Y uh, and even another one on Z but X and Y are common, the five axis machining is very common <coughs> you can also do six axis but that's like not practical for most things not super useful for the cost of doing that Usually okay. You have your uh, your just rotating with that, and that would take place of a six axis rotation. Yeah, yeah. You can have indexing on a sixth axis too. Like you can think about it like when the drill bit is spinning, you can spin it at a controlled angle, so it acts like a chuck. But that would be like the sixth axis in that case. Essentially, like three controllable indexed, indexed meaning you can control the angle three lathe chucks on each dimension with the ability to move those chucks, that would be six axis machining, for example. Um, okay, William, go next to lead in and lead out. What is lead in? Lead in is how you approach a workpiece. So you want to be most strategic in how you approach a workpiece. Say you want to cut out a square, um, you, a square that's, that's the corner of the square. You want to go in lead in you want to go straight to an edge and keep going I mean that's convenient you don't want to go for example go right to the side and then turn because you might have like a little imperfection there so lead in and lead out is how you enter and exit the workpiece to be most strategic about it and get the best results okay so let's um, oh yeah let's talk about so how do you know that so say you got these concepts and you're ready to say you're generating your g-code for something how do you know what you want what it's going to do well you got to be careful because machining can be very powerful and can be cutting up things you don't want to be cutting so you want to test it so probably a good idea would be to either remove the the two, the, the cutting bit or remove the workpiece and just hit run on that operation or like if it's a say a torch table just make it go without turning on the gas or anything so you can test whether it's really good because once you turn it on you're destroying metal and and you can't recover that. Yeah, there you go. That's one way to do it. There's also open source software to help you do that. For example, Chemotics Com is a software that simulates, if you give it a G-code, it simulates how, it actually gives you a visual representation of how that's going to look. Simulation. Go down. Simulations. Simulations. Oh, yeah. It'll actually go down. So, so screenshot, for example, will show you in a physical picture, okay, if you generate this G-code, this is how it's actually going to move throughout the workpiece. Very useful, fully open source. Okay. 
chemotics. So if you go, so this is a, in, a, in a document that I have. So what you're seeing there, that's online. You, uh, you can edit that document if it was shareable. Um, I'm going to share that right now. Change to anyone on the internet can edit that. So if you go to the wiki and go to the OSC machine design guide. Yes. So, oh, sure. C-A-M. Yes, you do. You can select everything like the properties of the tool head, the geometry, and all of that. So that's all in there. So now let's talk about the open source tool chains whereby you can generate the tool paths. So a start, a beginning is called Gerbil, G R B L. So this is a piece of software. It allows you to, to, to generate, to control any kind of, a, using an Arduino, control any kind of a motion. So basically what, what the 3D printer software does, it uses Gerbil as the back end of it. So Gerbil is basically the, the simple interface version of machine control that you can control directly through an Arduino and a USB cord. Uh, I don't know if that allows you to have like an SD card, I'm not really sure. But it's connecting an Arduino through a USB cord, and it says, um, well, let's talk about its performance. So off an Arduino, you're getting up to 30 kilohertz of stable, jitter-free uh, control pulses. In other words, you can go like 30,000 times per second in terms of what it can control. Like, 30, you can make 30,000 turns in one second. That's pretty good. Like, you can uh, do a lot with that. Uh, so that's right there from an Arduino. It's gerbil, the one that generates the G-code, right? Yeah, That's why the G gerbil, I think it's called gerbil. Um, it generates the G-code, yes, with 30 kilohertz of controllability. Man, okay. Yeah? I mean, when I've dealt with G-code, I generate it beforehand and then feed it to, like, um, feed it to, like, I stick it on the 3D printer. That, yeah. But this sounds like you are generating it real time and feeding it to a machine that is just listening yeah. and hanging on every word from your computer. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what it is. You're sending it through a USB cord, uh, which is an alternative to the standard, like the old stuff, which is parallel ports. Um, okay, so you can, on, on 3B, you can go to the list. I mean, man, there's so many of them. So Reddit is typically good on getting you a lot of good information. But look at all the CAM and software slicer software. There's like 30, 40 of them. There's a lot for PCBs. There's 3D printing, simulations and post processors, machine controllers. <laughs> so the list is huge. And then you have to select the, the smallest set that's useful for you. For us, we're saying um, FreeCAD, Marlin, Cura. And that gets you 3D printing, milling, all lasers, everything else. You can use Cura and Marlin for all of that. You can use all those other things too. So let's go through other tools that you can use. You can use Inkscape, for example. What is Inkscape? Inkscape is an excellent like professional vector graphics editor. It's like Photoshop for all platforms. What about Gimp? Click on Gix. Yeah, GIMP doesn't have a CNC plugin, but oh, Inkscape cool. has a... I didn't know that. cool. See, uh, GIMP is used for, for raster graphics. Okay, go back. Like, William, go back. Um, Click on the link in the document. Are, which are like 3B Inkscape. Okay, got it. Yeah, more like a Right. My yeah. brother uses Inkscape okay, for go, his Go back. Go back. Okay. Go back. Uh, I'm back at the main document. Click on Inkscape. Inkscape has a G-code tools extension, which allows you to generate G-code outputs for any kind of a 2D thing. Inkscape is in two dimensions. Excellent. Inkscape is a common platform to use. You, so click on the click on the G-code tools, which is the next link. Go back. G-code tools. So so what does that look like? G-code tools. allows you to draw shapes so scroll down you know you for example you draw that dinosaur go down until you get to the dinosaur go down yeah. you can draw that and then with that plug-in keep going down you know you keep drawing it and then it will convert that basically to your 
your toolpath, which you can export to any G-code processor like Cura, like what we do with the 3D printer software, that. You just <laughs> put that into that, and instead of 3D printing, you're doing, for example, milling or laser cutting. It's beautiful. So you do your so, design here, and then you feed it into yeah. the Cura, and the Cura generates the G-code cuts. You already generated the G-code. Cura activates the G-code and controls okay. the machines to do that. Um, G Code Tools extension, and then look at FreeCAD Path Workbench. And now, of course, FreeCAD is my favorite because that that has everything, and you can write extensions to it for everything. So you're drawing in FreeCAD, and out of that, you can output the actual toolpaths for three-dimensional <coughs> operations. This is Yorick, primarily from the FreeCAD team. Excellent work, um, and you can add any functionality to it. This came out only like a few <laughs> years ago. It's getting better and better. You also have LibreCAD, which is which is two dimensional. Go back, LibreCAD. LibreCAD. How do you know which one to choose? There's too many choices. Yeah. Just I pick. I said pick I one. Go, go like FreeCAD. Huh? FreeCAD. FreeCAD. Marlin export yeah. file. Yeah. Marlin Cura. What's a slicer? Yeah. It's slicer like Cura. is a thing for that generates three D printing. G codes. STL files. You input STL files, which are three dimensional files that you can export from FreeCAD, and it generates the whole path of how you're drawing that three dimensional object and going up. Do you, do you have one to change a hologram to G code? Create a hologram of mine. I want to make my own picture. Yeah, you, you 3D scan yourself, you, you put that into Cura, and that slices it and it will print that for you. Exactly. Exactly like you, Yay! even you. <laughs> you can be immortal. <laughs> Look at uh, LibreCAD. LibreCAD, we use that actually a lot. We design the FreeCAD, the, the two-dimensional cutting files for the brick press in LibreCAD. Now, that's a backwards way to do it because what you want to do is actually take, take uh, FreeCAD itself and export DXFs right out of that. FreeCAD has that. So if you want to design a three-dimensional brick press and then just take each part and and export a DXF of it so you don't have to do LibreCAD. So before we were doing LibreCAD and FreeCAD design, now we want to go FreeCAD, export DXFs. So DXFs are these two-dimensional file formats. Uh, DXF is, you have to convert that to G-code, there's plenty of things to do it, like for example DXF to G-code, or the Inkscape generates, the, uh, turns that into G-code, or in FreeCAD, FreeCAD can input DXFs and out, well, no, that, I missed that one, FreeCAD, you can ex export DXFs, once you have the DXF, you have to convert it to G-code, using a thing like, so we have Inkscape or DXF to G-code converter. Uh, so DXF to G-code converter, uh, click on that, SourceForge, uh, that is another fully open source program, but no, just select one which you like. Um, really the realistic options there are, I guess, Inkscape, since we use Inkscape already for other things, stay with a tool that you already know and just add an extension to it. But DXF to G-code uh, also exists, it's an option. Next in line is Linux CNC, which is a full machine controller and it allows you to visualize the toolpaths. It's a major open source project, it's been around for a long time. The only thing that I don't like about it is that you can't run off your USB port, you have to use a parallel port. So that's kind of uh, like, for our purposes, well, we'd have to get a b another bunch of computers with parallel ports, which is not super practical. I think they've done some work where you can get get uh, go through a USB connection but it's more tricky uh, I think you have to turn off you have to change your operating system so there is no interference in that communication um, but otherwise tons of people use it for all kinds of applications from robots to to anything next in line is hacking Marlin and Kira for 2D toolpaths so click on hacking Marlin so I mentioned that Marlin can be used for two-dimensional uh, milling as well, so instead of doing a three-dimensional STL, you input just a flat file. So there's a video right there of exactly how to do that. And in this example, if you click on that, so this guy here, that's probing within Marlin. So you're probing to get exactly the level of the PCB that you're milling in. 
and then you do the milling because you have to be very precise because if you go too deep your two paths they, they could get destroyed or be like too narrow or whatever if it's too shallow you're not uh, you're having short circuits if it's too deep you might wear out too much of that circuit so that's fully done with once again uh, Cura and Marlin the same tool chain so completely doable um, and we'd like to degenerate to one kind of a tool chain. So instead of the, using our custom, we, we do have our custom milling software that that Shane Oberloyer made with the D3D CNC circuit mill. But I'd rather use the same tool chain. So you just have to, you ha so you have to know less to do more, which is useful. Um, Hacking Marlin cure 2D toolpaths. So the 2D toolpaths can be whatever's in 2D, like laser cutting. It could be actually plotting a plotter. It could be cutting with a CNC uh, torch table or something. Yep. For CNC circuit milling, I would say right now because there isn't really any other turnkey package that is open source. I would say just use Marlin because I don't know of any other one really that that works really well. Uh, they, one project just kind of fizzled out, but just do that and maybe you know do that. Report back to us, document it. I've actually haven't done it because we used our custom software the last time, which was a year or two ago. So I haven't done that tool thing yet. Okay, let's go to online. You can also do do this kind of stuff online. Go to LaserWeb for lasers and mills. So laser web, that's pretty cool because it allows you to take any kind of a file. Uh, oh yeah, generate G-code from DXF, SVG, bitmap, JPEG, PNG. So actually, here's another one. Uh, we were talking about DXF to G-code. Well, laser web, right on the web, gets you to that. So then you can get two-dimensional files, the lasers, and CNC melts. If you can do a laser, you can do a CNC melt. Let's see who's uh, some noise in the back. Okay. Uh, so that's laser web. So once again, you can do that right on the internet. Um, but as I said, my uh, what we want to degenerate to degenerate as and go to like one small path that can do anything, and that's FreeCAD. You can generate STLs. That's for three-dimensional stuff. Uh, or you can generate DXFs. You can export. Well, if you do, if you degenerate to the smallest tool chain work with STL. So say you want to get a two-dimensional toolpath, um, because FreeCAD allows you to do STL and Cura can import STL directly, that's the shortest chain to 2D and 3D. So you go FreeCAD and click on FreeCAD to, to show you that it's cool and you can download it for free, your own parametric modeler. Uh, download now. I mean, look at the picture below that you can do all kinds of pretty good stuff with it these days uh, it's getting better and better so go FreeCAD STLs go to Marlin so click on Marlin firmware this is what we're talking about Marlin the open source RepRap driver it says uh, and the last time I loaded it up it said oh, something like open source control for everybody um, open whatever uh, and that changed um, there's Marlin and then click on Cura. The particular branch of Cura that we're using is Lulzbot Cura because we like Lulzbot, uh, a fully open source Libre 3D printer company that's growing quite well. They're one of the fastest growing company, computer companies. They get a lot of accolades, but you can download Cura uh, from Lulzbot. We like that more. The interface is better on Ubuntu. It's really nice. And uh, the originators of Cura are Ultim Ultimaker, which is uh, a proprietary printer with open source software. They put out Cura, but they have a proprietary printer. So we like to work more with people who are fully open. Um, so Cura for 2D and 3D. Okay, now let's keep going uh, for some more things. So PyCam, uh, why do I bring up PyCam? Uh, so it generates G codes from Linux CNC. Now here we're talking to CAM, which is computer aided manufacturing. And this actually allows you to um, show both. The, this is this is now about control. So it shows you the toolpaths. You can simulate them. Um, so it's a toolpath generator for three-axis machining. It loads STL and or 2D models. 
Uh, so that's also, uh, I guess, another alternative to using Cura. And it also simulates. Will it so generate the G code? Yeah, it says it, it generates G code. Mm -hmm. uh, GPL v3, fully open source. Uh, next is, uh, I, I already went through the open source nesting software, so that's, that's that. And just to wrap up on, on 3D printing concepts, um, people were asking how do, you, how, does, how do tool paths for a 3D printer work. I mentioned already that you can have control over various parameters, and some of the main ones you're concerned about is what nozzle size are you using, so you have to input that. Obviously, if you have a large nozzle, you have to go back and forth less times, so it'll be faster, faster printing. You can control the amount of infill from 100% to hollow objects, so you're just printing the, out, the outer edges of it. General workflow is you generate your file in our suggested pre-CAD, you export the STL, you go into Cura, and you hit print. Uh, so the workflow is very simple and accessible. When you generate the toolpaths, you want to have a configuration file in Cura, which contains all the information, like I've got a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, or my geometry of the bed is such and such, or my printing temperatures are such and such. You want to save all that information because there's a bunch of parameters that you can customize there. So uh, that's a .ini file. Uh, you can save that so you know if you have like 10 printers and they're all set up differently, you can use that configuration file for each printer because you don't just blank export your G, your G code, you don't slice for like some generic case, you have to slice based on the physical reality of your system. So you save your, your .ini files or for example if we add a heated enclosure then you might do things like, oh, now I can go way faster. So you would save that configuration that shows the optimal speed at which you can print using that. So it's very useful from a production engineering standpoint because otherwise you have to figure all that out. You have to do a test print. So that's the kind of stuff in production engineering that wants to be shared because there's an infinite number of variations um, that you can have for the kinds of printers and sizes of printers and even just say you want to lay out all the parts on a 3D printer bed for efficient printing, well, you can have three-dimensional nesting. We talked about two-dimensional nesting. Uh, I don't think, I've never heard of three-dimensional nesting. Well, you can do like a box inside of a box. It doesn't matter. Uh, you could do that. You'd have to be able to take it out. Uh, yeah. 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 No, you're right. But you can also, what I'm talking about 3D nesting, if you have a limited size, then you can do the trick like we bent, bent the panel to do 4D printing, or you can do, stack it vertically with little, little, uh, what were they called? Tabs. We learned that word. Put little tabs, and you can put one object and then print another one, on the top so you can fill your entire 8 by 8 by 8 inch cubic bed with then all the parts for a 3D printer in one run as opposed to doing it five times. So that's a very powerful concept. I haven't heard of anybody do that, but it would be great from the production engineering and marketing standpoint when you're printing the whole thing as a cube, including a box around it and put a stamp on it to ship it. Very convenient. That, that could make a business that's pretty robust if you're doing that, but you have to work out all the details, exactly what is the best configuration to make it the fastest, most efficient, if you're talking about economically significant production. Otherwise, you're kind of in a hobby realm and you're just doing that uh, for fun, maybe one time, but if, you're, if you want to produce that for others, then you care about how much energy you use, how much material you use. So that's not a, not a, hippie, uh, not a hippie thing, no. It's not a, not, a, not a crazy thing or it's just, oh, that's that's uh, not necessary. It is if you want to be ecological and, uh, and more efficient, which uh, so that's but to get to that that cube 3D printed shippable box, I mean, that's going to take some work. You're going to do some trial and error. So that's the, the, the value of such a such an initialization file or or the actual STL file 
that's got all those pieces put together and tabbed accordingly, that's really valuable because it's going to take you a bit of time to do that. So you control nozzle sizes. There's a very useful thing called vase mode within Cura where you print just the outer outer contour, for example, like a vase or a bottle where you're spiraling up continuously. The typical motion is you do one layer and then you jump up and do the next layer. In vase mode, you're doing spiraling up a thing, so you cannot really have any openings in that. It's a solid thing with a base, uh, but very useful and very fast. Uh, it prints very fast. Um, here, uh, the cool thing is you can just choose any bed size. So this adjusts to almost any printer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Cura can handle any size, any shape. A 3D printer from a tiny one with a four inch bed to as many meters as you like. Um, so, Lowe's Bot Cura, uh, let me show you Lowe's Bot Cura. Do you have Cura in there? It's on it. Oh, there, but do Lowe's Bot, man. Okay, so Lowe's Bot Cura looks better than that, and I have it on, on my thing. So, but when you, you, you simply throw a file in there, it appears, you can zoom in. And then um, you can hit save G code or yeah, like when you hit save G code, it will save it to an SD card on your computer. So your computer has to have an SD card, or you can just take this card and, and it, this. If you're connected with a USB port to the computer to the Arduino, it will have you print with the live connection through USB. But then you're taking up your computer, so you want to be typically you want to print out of an SD card. Um, as one way to do it. So that's that's Cura. I do recommend Lowsbot because it, it's actually really cool. Like when you pop in an object, it kind of like bursts with visual effects. Uh, it looks nice and and it's actually way faster than that. Uh, it's optimized for for Ubuntu and and Debian. So here I've noticed when I was using the original Cura on my computer, it would take forever to slice things. In uh, in a Lowsbot edition, if you're using um, if you're using Ubuntu, it's much faster. I actually don't know if it's fast on on um, the PCs because uh, I haven't used that. Yeah, virtual uh, Ubuntu. Virtual? No, real. Okay. Yeah, just run an Ubuntu installed. Okay, so that's three some things about 3D printing. Speeds and temperatures are some of the things you want to vary. Right now, we're printing at 50. The printer is capable of of 200 millimeters per second. And that's like blazing fast, but that's where you, you everything about your structure has to be really tight because, as I mentioned about inertial effects, when you have a motion in one direction and a rapid turnaround, it's a huge inertial force. In principle, you can have a one kilogram object produce one ton of force if you if you go uh, reverse it fast enough. That's called acceleration. It's it's not that that thing weighs a ton, but when there's an absolute sudden instantaneous jump that is an, a huge force so if your frame cannot handle it, you can only print slow um, but you want to go faster for better throughput and it's gonna take less energy because you're heating the bed for less time the bed is the the main energy sink of a 3d printer if you're using a heated bed so you do want to print fast as fast as you can um, so, and to wrap up, um, I'll just mention, like, if you, say, design a crazy machine like a screw machine, so a thing that does some crazy set of operations, say you want to make an extruder for the 3D printer, you would have a three-axis milling system, you definitely want to add another rotary axis so you can take an object and spin it and put features in other locations. Say you might even have, and you might have multiple tools in the setup, say without tool change even. So you're just using, just you just spend $50 for another universal axis, you add it to it. So you're talking about $50 to, to a few hundred dollars per axis, $50 about for a single 8 millimeter axis. But say you put a bunch of those functions together on a machine, and okay, how do I control it? Well, there's not going to be any any software that's going to allow you to do that off the shelf. Uh, what, but what can happen is uh, you can generate it manually. You, you, you understand you, you've built your system in such a way 
then that would be a case for, for manual generation of G-code uh, with relatively simple operations. For example, for an extruder, say you've got to go in and drill out the hole. So say, so you will write in the G-code, move this to this location so fast and then pull it out. And then move this in such a way, put this other hole in there and do that. Then maybe spin, spin that to make like a round part on it. But you can conceptually get that, that you can code that up if it's simple enough, where a lot of geometries like say the, you know, the extruder or other simple parts, you can just program that manually. Because otherwise, good luck finding an, uh, uh, an off-the-shelf solution. Well, you can, but that probably will cost you thousands of dollars for an off-the-shelf package that does that. So you can do that yourself using G-code. So that's kind of uh, what I wanted to cover on the toolpath generation, just main concepts and the fact that we have a very simple, robust tool chain to do anything. So if you go with FreeCAD to SDLs to Cura, you can do 2D and 3D for just about anything, including 3D printing. Any questions on a home front and on a remote front? We can have different heads doing different things. That's what you said, right? Say it again? You can have different heads on the same machine. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can put anything you want. Yes. That's that's essentially called a... that's a manufacturer. Yes, it's, called, it's essentially what they call a screw machine. So a screw machine is a thing that has a bunch of things coming in, typically has a rotating axis, might have a couple of rotating axes, but you can make screws, bolts, complex, uh, not too complex, well, any, anything. And we can bring on the printer. Well, you can do it with metal on the printer right now using the printers we have, but you can if you're do, taking a piece of aluminum or, or steel and making any anything out of that. And if you make it out of the two inch universal axis, you can be doing things like you put it, you can make a complete engine block on that thing. So um, it's up to you. Jean Paul. Do, do I see the path for 3D printing, FreeCAD, to generate the SDL to Cura, uh -huh. which generates you know, the, the, light, the slices? What is the path for, uh, for CNC? Well, CNC, like what kind of CNC? Okay, like uh, 3D. 3D mill? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can take FreeCAD, which has its toolpath workbench, and that generates the toolpaths right there. So you take the G code, put it on an SD card, and run it in Marlin. Okay. On your. You can go to Marlin. Yeah. You can do that. That's one way to do it. Marlin is a generic gerbil G code. For the circuit milling? Same. Uh, well, so what do you do? A little different. KiCad. I didn't actually didn't mention KiCad. So KiCad exports the G code files for milling. K I C A D. That's for electronic circuits. It has a lot of the functionality where you can you have part libraries of circuit components and all of that. Uh, so there you're not necessarily using FreeCAD, although you can draw a circuit up in FreeCAD if you wanted to, but it will be all a manual job. So KiCad will get you for the, for the milling of circuit. Yes, yes, and that's what we did. We used KiCad to generate the toolpath file, and in our case, we didn't use Marlin. We used our custom software to run that G-code, but you, you can use any G-code interpreter. Uh, let's see if there's any questions. Um, today, we're talking about toolpath generation, okay? Any other questions from the remote people? Any, uh, any people on site? Justin. Well, I guess if you're, if you're going to build your own custom machine, yeah. you have to tell, you have to, uh, tell the Gco, it's like, okay, this, this is x axis, this is C, you have to tell the where yeah. the parts are. Yes, you do, and you set that up within Marlin. There's configuration files there that you can, you can use where you set up the basic geometry, like I've got an XYZ system or whatever I have. Now, Marlin is not set up for doing things like um, if you talk about Cura, uh, when you talk about Cura, you would have, to, like for example, if you do a lathe operation, you would have to generate that G code, maybe if, for example in FreeCAD, you put that into Marlin. All you have to set up is, yeah, you have to match the physical reality, you have to do the settings within 
Marlin, because you're at the end of the day, you're running stepper motors. You have the ability to control five of them. So you, you have out of the box, you have the capacity to do five axis machining using Marlin. Now, if you need more, which typically don't, but if you do, you would do the external, like use some more of the pins on the ramps board to generate the signals for another stepper driver. You can add an external, another external stepper driver like we talked about in the controller session. Aiden? You might, yeah, there you go. Yeah, for a lathe, Aiden is saying, you can simply turn on, so you got your fast spinning chuck there, that's just an on and off signal that you execute through Marlin. Uh, through Cura, and then the other things could be like say other like the tool post might be an X X axis where you're actually going into that spinning object to get your shapes, and then you might have the long the lengthwise axis where you're moving the tool post that way. So, I mean, it's it's up to you, but you have to define the geometry somewhere. Yeah, Wh which is in a typically you do that in the settings in in Marlin. Now. Marlin may not have the custom solutions now for lathing, but if it's an open source project, so uh, for any programmers, please get us a lathing uh, add-on to Marlin. Marlin already has add-ons for laser cutting and, and milling. Um, there's You can add anything to it, is the point, because it's open source. So we can add on it, add and expand onto it infinitely. Any other questions? What's the setup of the current uh, 3D printers that they were built? Yeah. Yes. So currently we're using Arduino Mega with the Ramps Shield. So that's a standard, most one of the most widely used for 3D printers. The Marlin is interpreting your files and the stepper is telling the stepper drivers on the Ramps board what to do. And those stepper drivers could be running your 3D printer, or it could be anything else, depending on what code you're. Cura is involved in this. Cura is, if you don't use Cura for 3D print, if you're not doing 3D printing, uh, it depends. I mean, we mentioned there's a lot of different tool chains. Uh, if you want to use one single tool chain, go FreeCAD to Cura. Where in Cura, you're doing the slicing and generation of the G code but you're limited in how you, you will be slicing according to the algorithms of 3D printing, <coughs> which may or may not work for you. Like for example, if you have a bunch of lines uh, or like a, say a pattern of a wheel mount plate, yeah, you just draw that as a three-dimensional, a two-dimensional file, and then when, um, when it thinks it's a 3D print, it's not, it's just running another tool head you know, around that pattern. But you might have some issues like, okay, you have to jump to a hole. Um, you, can, you can look into that code and actually change things in there too. But yeah, haven't, done, haven't played with that yet, but it's, it's absolutely doable. Um, Ganesh, did you have a question? Um, any other questions in the house? I still am confused about the slicer. What is the question you have on slicer? What is the slicer? The slicer is nothing. It's like Kira. Yeah. Cutting carrots. The, the thing with a slicer is that you have a solid shape for, a, for as a 3D model, right? But you need to cut it into layers and then so that then in the, the printer can print out in layers, right? Because it starts by printing the bottom layer uh -huh. and then the next layer up and the next layer up. And that's why they call it a slicer. Because it cuts it in the in the layers. It cuts it in the layer, 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 layer. Yeah, it's like uh, one metaphor you can use is like a, a whatever icing on a cake. So you you know you put icing on a cake and you kind of draw something. You can do like a three dimensional oh, shape out of ice. Two layers to the cat. Yeah. So it gets a three D object and slices it, cuts it into layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to look at it as layer by layer. Your it's additive manufacturing starting from the bottom. So Cura do the G code and you can do the G code with it and then do the slicing. 
Yeah, it's it it's called. Market, right? Yeah, you do that all. Yeah, you go open up Cura, which we showed you before. Uh, you put in your three-dimensional object, and you just click generate G code, and then it generates that for you automatically. So wherever, uh, where where do you do that? Just save to file. Save to file, and it generates a G code file that you put on an SD card and insert it into your your controller on a 3D printer. After you dry it on some, after you dry it. That you have to get somewhere. Either download that, you make it yourself, or however you've generated it. You can download many things from part libraries like Thingiverse, or you imagine or whatever. Anything. In fact, like for example, in, in McMaster Car, all the industrial parts, they have, a, they have STL and step files for all of them. So you can down, <laughs> download and print. It's very powerful. It's the concept of a cloud repository of published design. So clear, so complete. I, I asked a question about hologram. Can they change the hologram to digital? I mean, to you. Yeah, a hologram is going to be some file format. I know. And then you... In order they don't, for you don't need to project it. They just change it. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you talking about starting from a 3D hologram, scan? Like when a hologram. Yeah. Okay. It's three dimensional. Like they make my hologram. Yeah. Is there any software to change that hologram to completely exactly the way my hologram is, for example? Well. Uh, depend. I mean, what's the file for? It depends. What's the file format of that hologram, and is there a hologram to SDL converter or something? I don't know. I haven't, haven't really haven't really asked that. But you can Google that right now and say, is there a way to convert holograms to SDL files? Type that in, and and you'll have your answer. I appreciate. Yeah. John. Yeah, man, that's what we're doing right now. So right now is the lesson. We're in 40 minutes from now. You're gonna know how to do this. So let's start that right now. Thanks everybody on the remote. You can also hang on to to what we're doing right now because we're gonna show that right now. So open up FreeCAD. Who's got FreeCAD? Um, who has FreeCAD? Does everyone have FreeCAD? Okay. Uh, bust out of your computers. Open up FreeCAD, whether it's 16 or 18. Um, yeah, so open, open up FreeCAD, and there's a basic workflow that I'd like to teach you, which, you, which eight people in Spain have, have taken 40 minutes to generate their first object. So, how does this work? Open up FreeCAD and then click on... Uh, okay, so somebody, hey William, can you do this? Because because we'll just do that for for a little bit, and then show everybody as we walk through these steps. So you open up FreeCAD. I'm gonna share my screen for the remote people. Share. So this is it. This is I mean the, the literacy and three dimensional drawing. That's a, one of the literacies like reading and writing. Click on a new new file in the upper left corner. And you, you get there. You go into the the what Freakin has is a bunch of workbenches under that tab there, under the Start tab. Go into the. Um, you can go into Sketcher or Part Design. Uh, just go to Sketcher. Yeah. Yeah. Who's got FreeCAD booted up? We got it. Who's got the blue screen? We got it. Does, does anybody not have that blue screen up? <laughs> I mean, all over there? So Do you have free cut? It doesn't appear on the same situation. So maybe somebody help him. So. Go into sketch. Should we do it in part design? Or? Part design. I usually do it in part design. Okay, so let's go to part design. Okay. Part design. Let's go to part design. So drag, go to part design workbench, and then.
do a sketch so you would go from there, right? You go body and sketch. Are you in 16 or 18? I'm in 16. So if you click on that, yeah. yeah. If you click on... You don't need to click on You can just click the, the sketch. But you click body first? I always click body and sketch. Oh, uh, uh, what if... Does it get you replicable yeah. results? Yeah. Click body and click sketch. If you're in 18, it's a body. Can you, uh, so there are, there are three or several buttons here. The workflow goes left to right. In FreeCAD 18, you click body, then you click sketch. So I just click the body, and then I'll click a sketch. I can do this completely again. Okay, just let's repeat that again. And I want you to show now. what happens when you click just sketch versus body and sketch. So okay. here's a brand new file. I'm going to go to hard design. And then we're going from left to right in, right in the workflow. We create a body and then a sketch. Create body, create sketch. Okay. Then it asks now, you to select a plane. X, Y is the simplest. You can do other planes. I just do X, Y. And I want to show everybody what happens when you reduce that because it's like body and then sketch. What is that? I would go click sketch. So what happens when you click go go back to fresh? And what happens when you do sketch Excuse without me. doing body? I, I am not where you are. Tell me how did you get the three lines out? We're actually starting over again a few times just to we're, let people. We're going so here's over and over. Fresh one. So Martin is suggesting we're just going to go sketch. Create a, create sketch. a new sketch. And so what's wrong with that? It. Click OK. Because I link it to the body. First, get to part design on the drop menu on the top. Okay. Drop menu. Now, what part happens part when you start when you don't have a body? Find out. Is it out of body experience? We did it. We're gonna do the out of body experience. Just click new sketch. That's that's what we did in Spain and it worked. So now you have the sketcher and you can draw any shape, size, whatever, using circles, lines, uh, arcs, everything. So click on, for example, like a, the square icon. Draw me a square. William, draw me a square. There you go. Who's got a square on their, their deal? The idea is you draw a shape, then you click close, and then you, then what's going to appear, click on pad, and you're going to generate a three-dimensional object. So now you generate your first three-dimensional object. Uh, so get to this step first. Where am I? I got it. Part design. Uh, Part design. Sketch. Right. Sketch, yeah. How did you create oh, sketch? Oh, got it. So you're in there. part design, you're in sketch. Now click OK because you're yes. in an XY plane. So, so you switch to part design? You did it. It's about the same. The yeah. tricky the thing design, about FreeCAD is you got you're like you do something then there's always like cancel yeah, OK on this side. Right. Yeah. You can do the right. Go to the right. So we've got a box. I click pad and I made this. So I select how thick it's going to be and then I go OK. So then after we got the X, Y plane up. Yeah. So now click. Now you can click on any drawing tool like. What's the drawing tool? You got to click. OK. The tricky thing is you got to click OK. Uh, I mean, you have to click OK first on whatever you're doing. Okay. Start page uh, Well, we were trying to make a. Uh, 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 oh, I bet you got it. So there you got to click okay. one X line. Oh, yeah. Click yeah. The, sorry. Click the X line and then click OK. Oh. There. So click on X, Y plane and then click OK. The tricky thing is understanding like what you've done. Like click on something, click OK or cancel. And then you have, then the big deal is model view and task view. Okay, draw me a shape, man. Give me a square. Click on model. Yeah, draw a square. And then what do you do after that? Click OK or close. Close. Close that. Now you can make it a pad, three dimensional pad. Pad it. There you go. You can draw your first shape. Rotate it. You got to rotate it. I don't know how you do that on a. Are you 
Is that a, is a mouse? You need a mouse, by the way. I got one in my car. <laughs> People can do it on a, you can do it on a touchpad, but I don't know how to do that. I had a mouse. Oh. Oh. And William always uses, how do you rotate on a touchpad? So shift and uh, left click. Shift left click. Left click. Left click. Doesn't work on Mac. With Mac, you just like hit the one button and then hit the one button twice and then hit the one button once again. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. I'm just joking. I know. Um, there's two views that you want to know. Like, oh, it disappeared. Yeah. In a in a menu, go to view perspective view. I like perspective view because because it won't disappear off the screen. <laughs> so, uh, who's got a first three-dimensional shape? Um, Ganesh, you working on it? Click on, click on the sketch there. There. And click on the X, Y, and click OK. And now, close it. Now pad it. There's options. Pad it. There's a bunch of options there. You click pad. Yeah. Uh, on the left. Where, 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 uh, yeah, it was okay. Where, what happened to your thing? Where did it go? We can take a look here. He's out, Matt. Can we look at it? I don't know what happened. But you did it. You show him how to do it. Okay. I'm trying to do it. Okay. So. Oh, here. See, that's the tricky thing. You got to select one and click OK. OK, there, you did it. Now, close, now close. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. No, you got to draw something. Draw a square. If you close it first, does it mess things up? No, you can go back into it by double click. So you draw a square, then close. Then pat it. Pat it. Okay, you did your first three dimensional object. You can change the parameters on the pad. If you double click on it, you can change the thickness of it. But now you've got one third of the entire CAD design. There's, there's cubes, there's certain spheres, and there's cylinders. You've got 33%. Overall world's
Does anyone know the boot menu for Chromebook? How to access boot menu on Chromebook? I usually when I on any computer I just hit F12 and delete F2 a bunch of times and hopefully one of them works. Well, we just match the whole F the whole function around. And then try to get And now uh well, I think it might want you to keep have that selected. So the next thing you want to do is go to the next thing. Well, my way, correct now, the double process, or maybe it's the next one, I don't know. So there we go. Yeah, oh, my yeah, like, <laughs> <doesn't laughs> That's not great. Can you run? Oh, yeah, I forget. Is this a recent version of the by the way? Or is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. again, but this time I don't want to close on the, on the sketch, I guess. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. 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 Once you drag the thing, it will show it up. It will show it up when it closes. So most um let me show you. Okay. You have to let me this Yeah, it's broken. No, it's broken. Just do a simple shape. Yeah, he did. He did. That's okay. Okay, so you want to go to the menu? Oh, yeah, we don't have to do it. Oh, now you can do it. Oh, okay. And now you can hit the chat. We're going to redo it. So now you want to keep it in the middle of the So, like, you want to do this. Like, here's something you can do. So, I think one time, then you keep doing it. You can do it. I mean, I would have hoped that it would meant to last longer than it has, but uh, uh, nothing's touching each other. I can't. Look at this. Wow. I don't actually like that. You don't usually use a map. So you make it. Okay, let it go. Now you do it. It didn't work. Next. Now you want to change the dimension. Do you do it? I mean, do you copy if you can from something out of a zip file? Or is it still hanging out of here? I want to get it up. Go up, go up, go up. You can hold it down. I mean, sometimes things don't like to run from the files. I don't know what's going on here. Maybe. I guess let me let me know when it's ready. Wander around, see if anybody else is doing something. Click on the side. Click on the side. Click on the side. Close it. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm just trying to figure out how to change that. Go back to that one. I'm assuming this is a parametric here. Uh, um, so like I'm trying to figure out how to change the size of the sketch. Now, let's say, make this thinner. Now, you rotate on Mac. How do you rotate on Mac? How do you rotate on Mac? How do you rotate on Mac? I get my program with that. I can't open it up again. How do I take this off? I don't know. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
We should be able to. And then you gotta hit okay, right? Okay. Alright. So I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go. You got it? No, no, no. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I don't know why. So why do you play it? Let's say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can double click it. You can double click on that and you can change it. You can change it only to information that there is. That's all you've got for the information. You can change the other stuff. So what is this then? Is that what you want to change? You can change the other stuff. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you can, you can. If I can get rid of my shadow, you have just read out. Don't hit close up. Don't hit close up. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I guess you could try hitting a tab and then see that one with a key hovering over the square. Because you're padding, that's all you're doing. Okay, so let's move on to the next step, which is the essence of the workflow. Alright. Depending what you want to see, make sure you're What'd you say it was? To Anyone to figure out how to rotate on that? If you click and drag on that one, does it does it rotate it? Isometric means three dimensional, hey, but it's actually a 30 degree angle. Can we actually drag the key up there? Okay. There's folded oh. things. That's <laughs> what I expected to happen. It's a 3D, it's a 3D look. Then it's like, um, you sure it's the value you're going to end up with? Yeah. Right? No, 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 no. From no. here, from here. Okay. Where are you going? It's about 30 degrees. Oh. I'm trying to zoom in, oh. but it's like, fuck you. Yeah. 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 I'm going to write this what? in my resume. Yeah, you've got one third. Oh, no problem. Well, it'll be probably more change with you in terms of me. Okay, so if I hit shift and the one finger drag, then you just like a what like a tactical Oh, uh, that be, wait, or you can try it again and see if, if it works the second time around. Okay, are people ready for the next step? So what you did? No? Ready? No? Okay, next step. So concept. This is the most powerful concept in the world for, for CAD. But it's, it's a very, very simple workflow which allows you to do all the parts that we need to do for the universal axis. And that is, you take your 3D object that you did, click on one side of it, and the beauty of this is when you click on one side, you select it, and now you can use that as your new surface for drawing. Be careful, so now you can actually select the whole thing. Don't select the whole thing. Just the one click surface. once, one time, and you can put a feature onto that face. It can be a pad, it can be a hole. And then after you've done that feature, you can select any other face and then continue to make a pad or a or a hole through that of any size and shape 
and he can do that process infinitely. That process which I just described, which means just putting features on faces, gets you to any shape that's required to draw the universal axis. So in 40 minutes you can get to actually doing that. So select a face. Create a sketch, add a feature to it, and then click close, then pad it or pocket it. And this is it. So practice this, and you'll see that this allows you to generate any geometry that you ever want. So I hit sketch here. I've got it selected. You got it selected? Yeah, so put a sketch on it. Um, I don't know if you selected just that, it sounds like you selected everything. Why do you rotate? Click on that. that one. So I have to think. So I there. No. That's perfect. That's a so that's three now. Yeah. So, so now just like this. Now one of these. Yeah, you can actually see here. Yeah, you can see here. Okay, so how much sometimes you, you can add something that can't. What, okay. what tells it close? When? How do you grab the thing? So if you did something you did as a sketch, then you can oh, no, close But it. if you did something else, then you need to select it. So or if it's, it's not selected. That sounds like a simple thing. Basically, the most recent thing you did is a sketch. When you select a sketch, it has a sketch on it. Then it's going to reference that. Context. No, it's already so And the menu changes so based on the context that you're in. Or you can do the other thing. You want to pad the other one. You have to select it. So the most you get rid of that. Okay, but how do you select the same? Because we keep, with this problem, we have to select the same. You have to start over. We have no idea how to fix it. So uh, how do you tend to select it? Basically, like if I look here, see, I I have two whole sketches here. Pocket. If I go oh, okay, oh, yeah. like yeah. in my original there you sketch, go. now you know how to do anything. Okay. Or sorry, my original <laughs> you can do sketch that. got padded to you can do that the other face. Faces. Now I you cannot draw shapes on the first one. This pad the second one. Only drawing flat faces. So if I want to go back to this sketch, you'll be able to draw an angle or something else to it. Like I can change it a little bit. How do you know? And this is just trial and error. Oh, because you don't know what you do. What? You don't have to select anything. What do you want to do? I want a two millimeter point sketch. Yeah. Then go back. Go to. And now make a new sketch. So go back to the hole. And double click on it. It's a new sketch. Go into. You can change its parameters like. Now you can draw. Be careful to draw within the shape. But it's going to just break because it's you're going to try to make a feature that's bigger than the piece of it. Well, I mean, they do that frequently with that. So, 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 but there are some cases where I could go beyond. After you do that feature, do another simple. feature on another side or on that. Or on that. Here. 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 And you can close. Here. The only limitation is you cannot draw like features on round surfaces. It yeah. only can be on planes. You're satisfied with that? Hit the close button. What happened to that? It's no, 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 Okay, actually, um, what's important is that you orient yourself to what you've done so far. So what I would do is wherever you are, just go back to the beginning and go to the start page and know that how to do that again. Be able to do that in a few seconds, you generate what you did in the last five minutes. So I, I would practice going out of that and then 
until the point where you can generate any size, any shape, like any time without like, oh, where do I go next? Like, do I have to press? What buttons I press? Yeah, we already got it, right? So now we're going to start. How do I make the point? Oh, yeah, we're yeah. Just like, yeah. Where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's oh, you're sitting. Even here. That's how I'm going to How did you do that? I see some of way down. I don't know how to go. Okay, can you hear me? So, no. First, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, me. Right foot to the right. I'm going to go away. And uh, when we start, we're going to choose our workbench front design. Design your front. See how it has a big dot in there. Let that be clear. You drag it. You drag it. You're going to actually try it in here if you want. Click it on there. Do you have a custom design? I don't know. I just use the pad. No, the thing is what you're doing. I'm pretty sure we use this for furniture. I know it's nice for CAD, but I... I just don't have my mouse here. Uh, okay, I can see. You can hold it down. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. Yeah. But you see, I do a lot of the goals here for like geometric. So, I'm going to go there. Yeah. So, okay, so now we want to create a body. Yeah, I've noticed so like right. multiple people right. doing this. Yeah. Just yeah. note yeah. that yeah. when you're making a box, you click and then click again. It's not click and drag. It's totally different than like. Right. right, you you select the corners and you don't like drag a, a box into existence. It's click and click. Click to click. One more click to lock it. Right. And now let's try some shape. We got a box. So now what are you going to say? Let's go. And you can create each one of these. Try and get that hard to say your name. If you click on a surface, then you select the surface, and you can zoom through and then you can see that with that little paper icon with that thing. Uh, I have not seen that before, uh, but let's click OK and help that. Here we go. When you downloaded FreeCAD, was it like... So I'm going to try uh, something in here. Uh, well, no, I mean, like, because there's different versions of things. Sometimes it's the unstable beta version or something like that. Can you show me the, just the page where you downloaded it from? So here I'm going to do one. I'm going to go to you. Okay. Design workbench. Hard design. I should download now. That should have worked fine and should have given you a good version. I don't know why it's, why it's having problems. Do it again? Just delete it and download it? I guess. They're like, it shouldn't matter, but I mean, you're having problems and it doesn't make sense for it to win that, so. From your part design, you create a sketch, you don't have a create a body for me. Oh, it opened up this one without giving me any shit. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Did you, oh, did you open it from the desktop this time? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I think this still should be basically the same, so your three cat has a body so let's just say with the other times, um, were you uh, opening it from the, yeah. the file? Last time, I was from the desktop and it showed up. Huh. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see whether it... Uh, so now just drag it on this way. Click and drag it on the bottom. You get the hang of it. So basically, yeah, everything will work. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And then drop on the gravy. Yeah.
you may have to call me and you can tell it's just like that. Delete 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 that. There we go. Okay. So, 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 so okay so guys so there's exam number one so <laughs> practice the thing where you have you can generate a shape and then put it either a feature either a pad or a or a hole through a shape so practice until you know that starting from the beginning screen you should be able to do that in one minute, you can get me a shape plus a cut, some kind of feature such as pad or cutout. Um, we did that in Spain, and eight people out of eight people, five people did that in one minute after 40 minutes of practice. Can you guys do that? Yes. Okay. So, who needs more time to practice that? Me. So you keep practicing. Yeah. Practice it. Oh, yeah. 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 Pick it up. Pick it up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So when you normally draw a shape, what you know what you're going to do with those points of the point. Like the song you know, cut this out, you might be able to do it. It would be nice if it's solid work. If you're doing like a true little thing, if you're going to do it all the way through the point, and you're here, you just have to do it like how deep it is. It doesn't matter what you're doing. So now that's what you need to do. Now we can test it. Now you 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 can test it. Find a variable forever. What is this? One thousand. What is it? Uh, open it's, uh, it's not a program for everybody, maybe. Yeah, it's a scan. It's a scan. It's a scan. That's an interesting name. Yeah, open scan. The thing is, it's basically making the same program. Okay. It does make things yeah. like it's like yeah. it's a yeah. on. Uh, 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 specifically it has its own program. Uh, 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 how does it uh, know uh, 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 have you noticed how it's a little bit fiddly? Like, it's like, at this point, you've got a kind of temptation to make some of it. I think it's about there, you know. Whereas in OpenCS, you can do pretty exact calculations. Right. Well, I'm pretty sure that you know you can what am I supposed to do though? So, oh, yes, you have a feature on the side. Oh, that's what you're supposed to do. So, you know how to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you can also just practice it to. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it so you know how to do all this. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you practice it, you put a pad or a ball on the instruments. I'm sure there is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're right, like, I think it was like a good idea. 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 Maybe you can't put a square ball on it. This is frustrating. There you got it. Okay. Uh, and then, no, you gotta select it. So you gotta click on that once. I think it's uh, so click on it. So I think it's selected. Um, no, but you double click it. So it's so it's in edit mode right now. So you gotta click OK. Go up. Go to tasks. So I think it's selected right now. Yeah, yeah, it is selected. So, so pad it. Now you can select So Start a new, start a new thing, man. I don't know what's happening, but that should have been down you a hole. Um, well, maybe you're doing the latest version, which may be unstable, maybe you have to download, like, not the latest one, but a stable version. Oh, I mean, uh, this is the one that downloads. That's the one that downloads. So, 
when you try to do that. Yeah. And that's what it does on the way it Yeah, you probably have to go to the way it is. Go to, go to the destination for an older version, so it's the download page. Go to the go down. Okay, so go for like an older version, like current stable version. Is that what you did before? Just be careful not to hear it so it becomes a problem and you really break it. That, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't really do much in this. Yeah, I need to do this path. So you can make another step so you have to click on the sketch. It may actually be a hexagon. But yeah, I'm going to do a hexagon for the sketch on this. Yeah, I'm going to do a hexagon. Do you want to bring that or put it in? I want to use a path here. Yeah, it doesn't like it doesn't do it it doesn't it 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 I've got two bodies in there, so I'm going to put them where you're at. Which is the first body? Start from scratch. Erase the second. Oh. Yeah, like, it's easy to start from scratch. Try it. Where is your right? 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 Where I want to change, let's say I want to change the, the width of this, right? If I'm not just by mouse, by a very specific width, right? So let me give you that. How do I get that, that by mouse? So go into the model view and click on that sketch. All I want to say, like, I want to go this, and 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 I want to go this, Ah, uh, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Yes. Now, 
Oh, you see yeah. having yeah. trouble with yeah. the whole yeah. tool? Yeah. It keeps crashing. Yeah, it's yeah. crashing. Yeah. I didn't see that on me. So that's that. Wow. Um, can you... Uh, circle in there? Maybe I'll update my computer. Maybe that's what it is. Could be. Um, yeah. Now we can also run live USB so I can get that copy for you. But okay, so who feels like they're ready for the one minute test? One, two, three. Amen. Let's practice a little bit. So practice a new document, sketch, pad, select the face, sketch pad again. I don't see any mentions. Can I actually do it like a practice? Okay. Well, I don't see any mentions over there, so it has to be kind of just ballparking. I don't, I don't, wait, wait, wait. Maybe you should clarify because I think some people over here think we have to replicate that. No, you don't have to replicate that. Like the, the exercise is simply you, you draw a shape in 2D, you extrude it to make a 3D, and then put another feature on the face that you select. Well, that's it. Very simple. That's why it can take only a minute. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But be able to do that replica, which means that you can you actually understand the menus and America. America. Oh, um, yeah. 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 So you have a live USB. A live USB with install of Firefox while by install of FreeCAD. So you actually install it. Yeah. See the app yet installed. No, but you installed Ubuntu or you're still running live Ubuntu? No, no, that's live Ubuntu. Okay. Oh, you want to install Ubuntu? I don't want to move because then you're... No, Ubuntu is no Ubuntu is, so, is installed. It is? You can flip back to his Chrome OS if you want to. Oh, you did a dual boot? Yes, yeah, yeah. Chrome OS and Ubuntu. Wow, I didn't even know that. I just saw that. Alright, boys. It's not live Ubuntu. So, we should figure it out now. We should figure it out. Let's just see what happens. It's, not it's downloaded on the computer. It's in, it's in the drive. That's pretty amazing. To flip back, you do that. Control R. Control R. Control R. Shift. I don't know if it's this back, this back, or this back. Oh, oh no, I no, just messed it up. Oh, I see, I see. Cool. And so if you want to go forward, you pull oh, that shift forward. Yeah. 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 Definitely are moving on that side. What's up, Yeah. cool. I can't have my name. I see it. It's a little Oh, can't you? I don't think it's on that one. Oh, it's a high school. Can't you see it? Here, I got it. I wish I could, but they're pretty good with some of this stuff. Oh, man. I think it's probably this kid, like, clip one of those. I don't know. It's fine. Let Martin select this. Um, no. Yeah, this is the oil one song I can do for my... Okay, yeah, I draw something from there and I'll put it. Oh my god! Your menus are a little bit convenient. That's the only challenge. All the... You always, you operate on the flash, you don't always run the stuff. Interesting. Hmm? Change the... Oh, you're trying to tell. It's fine. Do you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Now, so this is the second. So, so here's the sketch. Now, a quick uh, missile. Yeah, 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 uh, so you got to have to deal. Now, the you have to have to the surface. Wonder. I don't know what to do. Make a drawing. Sketch. sketch. I'm not sure if I found a picture or if I'm sending it to this pocket again. <laughs> um, that's it, and now draw something on there. What do you do? Do you want to do something to drag and drop something that's somewhere? That's just the way this guy is going. Alright, so, on this thing. So, so people, um, yeah. okay. some things about housekeeping. We want to do a tour today of the Sudico homes, so just to basically show you an off-grid house and what we did with the Open Building Institute. I was thinking we could do that at, at 115, 
I mean, we got we want to keep to the schedule for the remote people for the 2 p.m. afternoon session since people are planning to show up to that. So, uh, how, how about we do the tour like 1.15? So we're, I could be here back at 2, and maybe people can grab lunch uh, as I start the lecture, or is, would that work? Because we want to fit in, so, so Adrian is leaving today. No. 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 Oh, no. And um, he's got to go like two or three, so uh, we wouldn't he wouldn't be able to catch the yeah. tour. So I'm yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah, he's he's got to run. And one fifteen in the schedule. Yeah. Um, so the idea was to get through this exercise, the one minute exercise and then go through the workflow, what we discussed, okay. start designing the actual two-inch universal axis. Because if you know this, you can start, we can divide the task into all the people and individuals swarm on the design of the universal axis. Cool. So we can do that collaboratively. Uh, does that sound good? So maybe 115 for the tour? Uh, maybe like grab lunch at 2? Uh, tour. tour of the CD go home. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, it's just, so it's up 2,000 feet north for, from here, <laughs> uh, just going around so we don't get bitten by bugs. We can take the van up there. Um, yeah. Does that sound sound good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the CD go home, an off-grid house that we built through a swarm build process in five days, a couple of a few years ago. Just to, just to show some of the features of that and what open source design can do. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting. Are people interested in the CD go home or? Yeah, yeah. I would say it. Okay. Yeah. So maybe uh, how much more practice do we need here to, to get to the one minute test? Are we all doing it or just the people with computers? Everybody, whoever's got a computer. Well, those are two separate numbers. Whoever's got a computer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you such a nasty. <laughs> 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 okay, good. <laughs> 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 Now, 
You just copy the file or well, not not the size copy, just kind of one minute to do that. Wow, that's that's nice. Nice. Yeah. 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 But I think that uh, I just made a random shape and basically showed me how to uh, right. how to uh, how to kind of make that train to make it more precise and do that once it's more precise. But you guys are supposed to work. But I don't know what uh, Matthew is saying here. Where are the holes not working? They look like they're working there. But those are holes as a pocket. Oh, you want to make a hole? Yeah. I've never even used the hole feature. Really? But that that's, that's a hole. hole. No, <laughs> I know. But that's a pocket that yeah. is not just where true knowledge of the pad is particular. Okay. So I went to the whole feature at first. No. It didn't work. So, so, oh, yeah, it so, right. so I just forgot completely about the whole feature. Oh, and so, so, I I so, so what's up with the whole feature? I don't know. That's the when I walk in the forest, uh, I just do turn that. Actually, I don't. That's a good idea. That sounds good, man. Make sure it's like, you see what happens when you buy it. Three separate people around the entire time. You can't even see that he's eating it. Couple <laughs> hours later, he's <laughs> like, What is it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't know exactly how the fuck is going to it. Yeah, I know. I know exactly how the fuck is going to be. Oh, yeah. 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 So that's, I have seen what happened with, with uh, like, Brandon. Uh, some Brandon serious things I've got my hole in it. It's not so punching holes through. <laughs> 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 I've seen what happened with the rectangle thing. And then, oh, that's and then three, 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 uh, okay. So that's no, no, hold on, hold on. Go back to the model. Far, you guys are. Well, let's let's do it. Pop it. it. Okay. That's that. Yeah. Uh, no, that's interesting. Uh, Focus on which one. The hole? Yeah. No, I think it's the pocket. Uh, so, um, because a hole is. So you've a got hole. another feature there. Where's right. the pocket? You don't have uh, a thing. No, I don't. I guess it's a round thing. You got that? Go. That's it. But you got to select it. Alright, let's do it. So on this surface, we're gonna create a new sketch. Uh, 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 okay. The hole doesn't do what we do. We do the punch through the hole. Oh, it's like 
you can be in like one of those Well, you, you, <laughs> you select, you select the surface oh, yeah. first. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Hey everybody, let's do this exercise because what we want to do is yeah. get, definitely get to the collaborative design process with everybody as we pull all the parts together to, to make the design because the, the deal for today is there a place that I can sit at the table? It's a little hard to run a mouse. Go ahead here. Yeah. 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 I'll shift the mirror back to the Um, so we've got five days, people, just for, just for a reality check. We've got okay. five days and an opportunity to build two different machines. Uh, for one, for the torch table, we can we can take parts from the one that already exists and we can rework that to a new version. For the two-inch axis version, that means we're going to have to get all the printers up. So what I would suggest is that we teach people about the, the collaborative swarm and maybe uh, we can start that and do that, but maybe a few people go into the workshop to finish up the printers. Last night we got the extruders done. The bed's almost done, and it's right now it's assembly and wiring to make those things run. But uh, today we can, if we're actually, go ahead. Actually here, yeah, so so people who want to design stay here, and people who want to do printers go into the the shop. There's a balance. Yeah, yeah. So let's do um, let's do the couple of things. So. Right now, the test. So, so the idea is start from new document, and the problem statement is to draw a three-dimensional shape, and then on one of one of its sides, draw a feature, either a hole or a pocket, in one minute. So that teaches you the whole workflow that. If you can do that, then you can continue that process of draw another feature and another on different faces, a workflow that is sufficient to do the design we need on the universal axis, uh, the big one, which is going to be an interesting experiment. So make sure you know how to do that. Maybe practice that if we don't do that right now. But let's, uh, let's get out the timer. And this is a good data point, so I love it. I'm going to get a timer and click it, and I'm going to say stop in one minute, and we're going to count the number of people that have finished that, that task, and we, we can look at people's work uh, if you connect to the screen. And are we building a certain kind of? Or just, uh, say again? Are we, just, are, we build, are we building a certain design, or are we just putting... No, you're, you're doing anything that you like. Okay. Any three-dimensional shape. It could be a, a spherical, whatever, round, curved, any shape. And then you're taking one of, one of its sides. It has to be a flat side because you cannot, FreeCAD doesn't allow you to do that on the round parts. But. Um, on the flat sides. Unless you create only on the flat a, sides. a plane, right? Once you create or, a plane. Or you create a body that intersects with it and fully and operates out of it. Yeah. So for now, the very simple workflow, which is the point of that is that it's sufficient for what we need to do on the collaborative team design. So let's try that process, and I am going to hit. So does anyone have any questions on what we the task is? So one object with one feature in 3D. What is Michael. the starting point? Are we starting with free play? Starting blank, 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 start blank, 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 blank page. So actually part of that is click on a blank page is your step number one. Got it. Okay. All right. So any other questions? No. No, no questions? Then I'm hitting start.
Done. Holy cow. <laughs> At about 35 seconds, holy cow. <laughs> Feel free to do the same. <laughs> Done. 50. Nice. 50 or so. 50. 50, you got it? Yeah. That's straight. Okay, we got one minute. Actually, continue, continue until you're done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you two minutes. Let's see if everyone finishes in two minutes. We got three out of fifteen. How long have we been training? About forty minutes or so. I got that. Got it. One, one eighteen. And my thing froze and had to reset. Holy so cow! Just, <laughs> just, done. Done. Okay. Five. Oh, at one twenty-eight. Two minutes done. Okay. Six in two minutes. Continue. Just give you one last minute. Let's see how much, how many more people can get to the finish line. So we're gonna we're gonna get six total. With like the like distributed workflow. Yes. Okay. Right very now. Cool. Right That's now. very cool. So does that work on like one like global file and then you have like a bunch Split of it. files? Split it. And well, yeah, that's what I mean. we'll okay. Okay. Then that, we that's put it all together, yeah. merge yeah. using yeah. merge. Oh. Yeah. Two minutes yeah. thirty, so about thirty seconds left. Mm -hmm. Many? I'm curious if that's something like that works with like you can build on the same thing. We got seven people. Kind of like like you just have like you have like a, a global form of system and then each part kind of works doing like, test two reference yeah, part. Did you that mm -hmm. did you know what it says? Yeah, no, I didn't say I was done. I was done like and then just automatically so, go around and just automatically go around and look at the global model and then just make sure that they're going to have one. There are two models, there are two models. Okay, three minutes. So is it that we have seven? Who did not finish yet? One, two, three, four. Well done. Were you counted in the seven people before? No, I didn't. Okay, so oh, about, about three minutes. I downloaded the program. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, so about four minutes. Well, uh, so the stats are we got three people done in one minute, six people in two minutes. I would have been done in one minute. And something. So, uh, dude, it cut off. It had to open Okay, it all right. Well, I, what I would suggest is, yeah, just try to get this workflow so you really know it because it's... Uh, then, you, then that means you really understand the whole, it's really about the menus, like the OKs and click finish, what you're selecting the tree view versus the task view. And yeah, so you kind of have to get familiar with that, but you'll get practice as we go along. Okay. So let's move on right to the exercise. For that, please go to a document, which is, we're gonna start this right now. Let's go to the universal access page on a wiki for people that have a computer. Universal, uh, universal access, two inch universal access. It's linked from the universal access page. Okay, so, and we will start that in a document where we get very clear about what all the elements are. Because without that kind of clarity, we'll be designing things that will not fit together. So we need to, we need to start with that. Um,